Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. Welcome to a new year, a new world, a post Trump, nearly almost maybe post pandemic reawakening, an opportunity to lift our gaze from the flickering lights of our phones and our Netflix marathons to crawl out of the squalid morass of online arguments with their algorithmic distractions and their comforting outrages and to slough off the fake news and take a deep breath of the real world, of real Zoomless hangouts with flesh and blood friends who you can talk to and reason with and at long last have face-to-face conversations with that are generous and unruly and loving and spirited and maybe, hopefully, a little bit uncomfortable. Welcome to the first show of the new season of Uncomfortable Conversations with me, Josh Zepps. This is the safe space for unsafe ideas. And the good news is that uh, after a short hiatus, which you will notice we've had, this is something uh, with which my longtime podcast fans will uh, will now be somewhat familiar, you patient little darlings, you. Uh, the show has been picked up by a podcast network, Acast, which was actually the first network that ever picked up We The People Live back in the day. So I'm coming back home, baby. Chicken's coming home to roost. Uh, And I'm delighted to be part of Acast again. What that's going to mean for you is more regular episodes, occasional ads, uh, and ultimately the opportunity to avoid those ads and get even more great content by supporting the show, as so many of you did with We The People Live. So lots of great stuff coming up in 2021. I deleted the Twitter app and the Facebook app off my phone this week. It felt like a mini triumph. I wonder if you've done it. I wonder if you had the same feeling I did of weary satisfaction, grudging terror. In my case, it was because Australia has been going through something of a reckoning about sexual assault in Parliament House and amongst senior government ministers, allegedly. And the conversation on social media has been as unedifying as you would expect it to be on social media, with everyone scoring the easiest of shots. And it's such a sad issue. It's so violating, and it so shakes me to my core when I hear the stories of some of the young women who have apparently been through this, that I just wanted to have no more part of that conversation. So today we're going to have a more interesting and nuanced conversation in honour, essentially, of International Women's Day at a time of great irony for that moment in Australia, since it seems like so little has changed in Australian politics, at least. It's, it's quite bizarre. What I mean by the the social media debate being so stupid is that for background, if you're not Australian or if you haven't been paying any attention to the news, the Attorney General of Australia was accused a few weeks ago of a historical rape by a woman who took her own life. And so there's no, nothing the cops can do about this. This was more than 30 years ago when he was a teenager. And, There's no way of proving that beyond reasonable doubt. So what should happen? He has stepped aside temporarily. We don't know how long that's going to last for. He's still a parliamentarian. The Prime Minister seems to have his back. And this comes in the wake of there having been some current affairs reports and some investigative journalism last year that raised questions about his propriety with other members of his staff, and not just him, but many senior people in the ruling Liberal Party. 
sort of hitting on staff, having extramarital affairs, the fact that their politics is very pro-family values and that many of them were anti-gay marriage is, of course, raised as a, a legitimate source of hypocrisy. But until the past few weeks when this allegation arose of actual violent rape, that was all just sort of unseemly nonsense, not potentially criminal behaviour. And what ended up happening was that my social media feed was full of two equally stupid, (laughs) equally strident opinions. On the one hand, the backers of the Attorney General saying, if you're not convicted in a court of law and you can't prove something beyond reasonable doubt, then everyone is entitled to the presumption of innocence and there should be absolutely no consequences or even really investigation, since it's impossible to conduct such an investigation, therefore every man should get off scot-free, even if there are plausible claims made. I mean, it seems that this alleged victim did have some contemporaneous accounts writing in her diary more than 30 years ago about what happened and telling friends some years ago about what happened. There's no reason to think there's absolutely no there there, just because it doesn't meet the test of a, a legal standard in a court of law. And then on the other side, you have people saying, well, all women have to always be believed, essentially, so he needs to resign because the accusation has been made. And anyone against whom such an accusation gets made has to be treated as if they're guilty. I mean, this is not, this is insane. This is, this is turning us all deranged. Peter Van Onselen, who's a mate of mine, who's a great journo and a good bloke, who also happened to be friends with the Attorney General from back in the day. This is all part of the problem as well, isn't it? That There are these boys' clubs from private school where so many of the rich and powerful all sort of knew each other. So there is a bit of a clique going on here. But let's assume that there's perfect, that they're able to put that aside and be perfectly impartial in upholding their own journalistic point of view. Even if that were the case, Peter Van Onselen wrote a piece saying that this was a chilling and disgraceful denial of basic rights. He's talking about the Attorney General's rights. He's talking about the right of an accused rapist to not face any consequence in the public square unless or until he's found guilty by a judge or jury. I'm sorry, Pete. I love you, mate, but that's just silly. The whole lesson of the past few years of reckoning with gender politics was to try to figure out a way of talking about this stuff without saying that the only forum in which to do so is in front of a jury. And then on the other side, David Crowe, who's the chief political correspondent at the other, so Peter, Peter Van Onselen works for The Australian, works for Rupert Murdoch, then the other big newspaper company in Australia is Nine or Fairfax, where David Crowe, who's also a brilliant guy who I have enormous respect for, wrote an opinion piece entitled, Prime Minister, if you believe Porter, say so. If not, ask him to resign. Hang on, whatever happened to upholding the principle of assuming that someone's innocent, even if you don't believe they're innocent? Now I'm flipping back to Peter Van Onselen's side and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I can say that I don't think that we should... It's, It's completely consistent for the Prime Minister of Australia to say... I don't know whether or not my Attorney General did it. Therefore, I'm going to presume innocence rather than presuming guilt. This is one thing that gets me so frustrated. It's like like nobody understands principles anymore. It's the same with free speech. It's like if I defend the right of a Nazi to say something, people accuse me of being pro-Nazi. No, I'm not. I'm pro the principle that people should be allowed to speak their minds, and then I can smash that, that Nazi using logic. I'm like, it doesn't mean that I like the speech and it doesn't mean that I believe that the person didn't do it if I want them to be entitled to the presumption of innocence. God, this is all messy, isn't it? Well, today we've got a wonderful, wonderful conversation with a brilliant person (laughs) who can help us think through, not this specifically, we're not going to talk about sexual assault. I want to use this as an opportunity, as a moment to have a bigger conversation about feminism, about gender equity about what it means to be a woman, about what powerful womanhood looks like in the 21st century. And Megan Daum is the perfect person to have that conversation with. 
she we actually recorded this bef- I think it was before the US election. It was a while ago now, before we started, before I put the podcast on pause to trans- transition it over to Acast, the new network. And I've had this one in the bag, just looking forward, rubbing my hands together with glee in releasing it for you. Because Megan is a badass feminist. That's an in-joke that you'll get. She doesn't like being called badass. <laughs> she thinks that's one of those cheesy slogans that uh, that millennial girls use. But she is a badass feminist. And she doesn't conform necessarily to the conventional ideas about what feminist empowerment looks like. And this is a slightly perhaps bad taste episode to release in honour of International Women's Day, if you think that all women have to think alike, if you think that the only version of feminism that should exist is the orthodox one. Megan doesn't. I don't. This podcast doesn't. This podcast is supposed to be a place where we can talk about things from a slightly more left-field perspective, where we actually get our hands dirty in the intellectual weeds instead of conforming to some preset bunch of notions that have been handed down by the uh, the elites. So enjoy Megan's take on not just feminism and womanhood, but really the whole culture wars. This I read her book and absolutely loved it. It's called The Problem With Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. The New York Times named it a notable, notable book when it came out in 2019. Uh, it got rave reviews from places that you might, <laughs> that might have been a bit surprising, like the New York Times Book Review and the New York Post and Vogue and so on. Uh, Megan writes for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, she, well, she doesn't anymore. She was an opinion columnist there for over a decade. She's written in the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic. Uh, she's an adjunct associate professor in, in the graduate writing program at Columbia University, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. But she also has a podcast, which you should subscribe to, which I was a guest on, uh, and which we have a very different conversation than this one. Her podcast is called The Unspeakable Enjoy my conversation with Megan Down. What is dog playing here? No, what is going to be my fault is if my dog barks. I have done every single. I have taken every precaution to ensure that he's quiet, but he's also eight months old. So, oh, that's so cross. cute. We well, could do the whole thing about him. What kind of dog is he? He's in Newfoundland. I can't he's picture gig- a Newfoundland. He's gigantic. They're, they look like big bears. Are they They're like St. Bernard's? Big... Well, I had a St. Bernard before. I have a dog type. Uh, hmm. th- they're like in the same, they're similar type, but they're black. They're usually all black. They look like bears. They're Where do huge. you live, Megan? I live in an apartment in Manhattan. Yeah, I'm that's a what... horrible person. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> Although they probably don't need a lot of exercise. Is that right? Not when they're old. Not when they're older, right? No, but uh, this, they, we're talking about an eight-month-old puppy. But he goes to um, – <laughs> we're not recording, are we? <laughs> he goes to trail yes. camp. He goes to trail camp in the mornings. He gets picked up oh in a God. van and taken with a pack of dogs to oh run on trails upstate and swim. So, but How that's, long does he's, that take? Um, not long enough. He's, yeah. I think he's, I think he's first on the drop off route. So he comes back too early, but this is only, we were, I was on a farm with him. Right. I was, I went away during the pandemic. So I was on a farm with him down South for almost six months. So do you this ever, is just do you ever consider asking transition. them to change the route of the van so that he spends more time on the road? I did, but I don't want to <laughs> give myself away. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, that's nice. I remember when I moved to Manhattan, seeing people walking down the street with like great Danes. And thinking, is that yeah. is that are they trying to project like big dick energy that they've got a large place in a in a in like the most expensive real estate in the world, or is it that Great Danes actually don't need a lot of? Then I found out later the Great Danes actually don't need a lot of space because they just sit there like a lump. So you can have they're you actually noticed, pretty good in a small apartment. Well, that's true of big dogs generally. But have you noticed that people who have Great Danes often have two? Yeah, like they have to have a matching pair. Yeah, yeah. and also it's their weird. faces look like Great Danes. The people's faces. Yes, that's right. So there are three. That's right. In total. Yeah, it's one of those like, uh, yeah, it's sort of like it, Great Danes are like end tables. Yeah. And, and you the need a person pair. is the bed. The pe- yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. I think we've solved everything. 
Well, thank you for being with us. I'm interested in talking to you um, about basically conformism and nonconformism in life across a number of metrics. Uh, kids and not having kids, spouses and not having spouses, uh, sex and not having sex, uh, gender pride and not having gender pride. Wow. Uh, and specifically the ways that all of these intersect with with being a woman and what I should know about feminism and womanhood as the father of a three-year-old girl in a same-sex relationship with another guy who, who understands nothing of, uh, of your kind. So explain women to me, Megan. Well, you really prepare for your interviews. <laughs> really thought that through. <laughs> the, That's why they metrics. don't pay me any big bucks. Say? Across metrics? Across various. I may have said across, metrics. I may have may have used some I other jargon. To, I think you want to say at the intersections of. At the intersection of various phenomena. That's the jargon now. At yeah, the intersectionality of, is yes. very big. We can get into right. intersectionality if you want, because um, that's you're not uh, just a woman, Megan. You're a female American. You're a disabled person or, mm-hmm. sorry, person living with well, disabilities. That you're goes a, without saying. Yeah, <laughs> one of them's here right next to me chewing on a bone. So there you go. One of your disabilities? My disability is my dog. Right, like, okay. can you have the, the dog itself is a disability. So if mm. you need the, the service dog to help you. With how, the, have the, they changed the, the rules about service dogs on planes in the United States? I must say that's one thing that a non-American notices when flying domestically. Well, apart from the fact that the whole thing is just like being in Auschwitz, but that, that people are bringing many, many pets on, on pl- unnecessary numbers of pets on planes. I think they keep threatening to change the rules. The The thing is they're not legally allowed to ask what your disability is because of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I believe it's under that or one of those kinds of statutes. Yeah. So they can't ask you. So if you show up and say, this is my service dog, they're actually not allowed to question you. Yeah, I know. I was on a flight. I think it was like around last Thanksgiving. There were probably 12 dogs on yeah. the plane. Yeah. yeah. Of varying sizes and odors. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this so is anyway, the, this is another interesting thing that I've noticed about America. And, you know, just as an aside, this will just be a rambling conversation. I'm trying Don't to, I'm, I'm actually trying to think about how to answer your question. As Good. We, as okay. We you can stew on so that. It's going. like, I've, I've, it's like I've thrown okay. all of the yep. celery and potatoes into the big okay. stew and it's just bubbling away there, simmering. And you're going to come out with a fantastical okay. ejaculation of genius at some point during oh, wow. the podcast. Uh, but I for am now, let's just let's just focus on uh, the, this particular peculiarity of America, which is it's it claims to be a very free and sort of libertarian. There is this sort of strand of kind of frontier libertarianism that runs through America, but the respects yes. in which America has opted for bureau- a bureaucratic style of sort of statist uh, socialist fascism are among the most bureaucratic and imposing of any place that I've, of any country that I've ever lived in, by which I mean something like the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? We don't normally think of the United States as being a paragon of uh, support for minorities and for uh, people living with disabilities. It tends to pride itself more on a free market orientation, a little bit more sink or swim, a little bit more capitalist, a little bit more, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, but we're not going to hold you by the hand. We're not Denmark. And yet, Something like the example that you just gave of, of, you know, you're literally not allowed to ask a person who's getting on a plane with a ferret what they, why they need a ferret because it yeah. says here under Rule 173B, subsection K, that you have to do that. It's like that at, like, the the post office is, it seems like you're in the Soviet Union. Oh, Everything that sure. had, you know, that I don't understand why the to DMV, get a driver's the Department license. Department of Motor Vehicles. Is, yes. Yeah, when I moved yeah. to the States, I was like, why does everyone keep joking about the Department of Motor Vehicles? Because in my state in Australia, you need your license, you go in, you take a number, you wait for seven minutes, someone calls you, and then you're out. And it's 20 minutes later, and you've, you've done your thing. And everyone was like, oh, my God, it's a nightmare. And I kept saying, but why? Like, why? Why don't they just hire more people? Like, if everyone knows that this is a problem... And it's been this way for decades. You can see stand-up comics in the 1980s talking about how terrible get, it is to get a license. Like, hasn't anyone thought, well, maybe we should just either fire everyone who works at the DMV and just hire a whole bunch of new people or retrain them or hire more people? Right. Anyway, uh, that's just my, observa- well, my little I don't know. observation about America. I don't know because America. there's this constant push and pull between big government and small government. So but who there are big government mechanisms big government? in place. Well, that's you, you sound like a Republican now. Yeah. I do, don't I? But I don't want, but I, but I just want government that works. I mean, it reminds me of Al Franken's line that Republicans say that government doesn't work, and then they get into power and prove it. 
<laughs> right. You know, like, I mean, you know what I'm, yeah, I, actually this does fold into your, uh, your, your, your enormous opening question. Like please. I am somebody who is, I feel I, I'm really a big supporter of the idea of universal daycare, right? Even though I don't have kids, I think mm. that's really, really important. But then you imagine like if there was government sort of sponsored or subsidized daycare, like it would be like taking your kid to the post office or the mm. DMV every day and dropping them off and leaving it. This there. is why I think a lot of Americans are worried about like providing health care to everybody as well. Because if you did it the British way, where the government literally runs hospitals and like it's actually a government department, I mean, it's bad enough in the UK. Can you imagine how bad it would be if, if the United States government tried to run, yeah. actually run health care? But that's a, a false choice because most, most mixed economies that have high standards of living like Australia and Germany and places like that have have the private sector actually run the stuff and the government just picks up the tab. Mm-hmm. Is that how it would work here? I don't That's know. I really here. don't know. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. Well, now well. I've spoken enough. Uh, what, what are your, uh, what, what are your ejaculations uh, of insights, what is, Megan? What is it like to be a woman? You want me to ejaculate some insights <laughs> about being a woman? Is that what you're asking? Maybe, maybe I misspoke oh. earlier. Maybe I should cut that bit out of the podcast. No, just talk about no. Great Danes and St. Bernard's the whole time. <laughs> well... Yeah, but then you still can't get that one of the that things that's calculation out of my mind. One now. of the thing, one of the things that's interesting. Just forget about that. We're not going to be. This is. There's nothing. That was a metaphor. It, I misspoke. Of course. Uh, no, you didn't. You know, in speak. 15 years, I'll probably be cancelled for it. For that, mm. maybe, maybe. I'm also also this whole conversation is suffused with the assumption that only uh, men have penises because that's uh, we're gendering ejaculation here. But uh, you right. know, uh, maybe there are trans women who are ejaculating all over the place just listening to this conversation. I apologize for that, uh, that mental image. You can well, only hope. You, yeah. We can only hope. That's, uh, that's the number one iTunes rating that uh, review that I want. Uh, Love the show so much. Came all over my trans boobs. Uh, <laughs> Megan, one of the interesting things about your writing is your conflictedness about feminism. And I oh, think... I'm conflicted about everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's start, let's start with feminism because I think it's a, yeah. an interesting take and it's one that I can't r- really access, at least from, a personal, from the point of view of personal experience. Um, where should we begin? Well, I guess we can begin in the 1970s. Part of the way I think about this stuff, uh, you know, I I grew up in the I was born in 1970, so I was a little girl in the 70s. I was a teenager in the 80s, and I had a second wave feminist mother. I remember her being devastated when the Equal Rights Amendment was not, you know, was dead in the water. Finally, it was 1982, but like I never had a sense of myself as a girl, as anything but equal to boys, actually like the girls were doing better than the boys. The boys were disruptive in class. And by the time I was in college, there were more women going to college and getting secondary educations than men. It's even more so that way now. So I just, I guess I, I had this experience of sort of going through life. And again, caveat, this is from a privileged perspective, but I think this is pretty, you know, much across the board. If you were a woman during that time, you never really had any reason to think of yourself as uh, lower than men or of uh, oppressed class in any way. And then fast forward a couple of decades, around 2014 or so, I started noticing that the default conversation online, especially about women and feminism, was that we were under the thumb of this constantly oppressive patriarchy. And just being a woman in the world, you know, paying your rent on time and going out the door and getting on the bus and going to work was so difficult that you were a badass if you could just achieve this. And there was this whole like vocabulary that emerged around um, this this ostensible experience of of hardship as as a woman and triumphing over adversity, you know, every step you take down the street. And I just thought it was really at odds with my quote lived experience and actually any sort of reality. So that's when I started to wonder if I was missing something or um, if the world had changed in ways that I hadn't noticed, or I wasn't really sure what was going on. Did you find it disempowering? I found it. uh, No, I, I mean, I found it confusing. I found it alienating because I really always, I had my friends and my peers and we were always, pretty much on the same page. I mean, I suspect you found this too, just in thinking about these 
culture war issues generally. Like we we kind of went through life for decades, you know, feeling like we all generally saw the same reality and you know we might have had small differences about things but i i could pretty much assume that my classmates or my colleagues or you know my my peers you know overall that we pretty much agreed about most things and on the stuff that we didn't agree on it really didn't matter but suddenly um it was like everyone was on board with this idea that there was toxic masculinity and that we you know, that it was okay to constantly beat up on men and make fun of men. And it just seemed to me, um, what was disempowering was, was assuming that men had so much power over you right. <laughs> that you could, that you could make fun of them, uh, you know, with, with, with impunity. Um, and that to me is actually quite disempowering. And that makes me kind of angry. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good point because the the men in my life who have been so emasculated that they would find what you're saying offensive, uh, who will constantly make jokes themselves about their own male privilege, and you know will be will be cowed into not talking over someone in a boisterous conversation if that person is a woman because that for fear of being accused of mansplaining where they would speak exactly the same way to a man and they'd have this sort of double standard. People who are playing that game of of sort of feeling guilty for their masculinity will will often cast it as well you know we've had our turn for thousands of years and so now it's the girl's turn to you know to be able to lord it over us as if the only downside to this idea of female fragility is one that's imposed on men that now men are going to have to endure not having to talk over everybody but that's not the downside i see i'm fine with not talking over anyone if they don't want me to the downside is i i want the women in my life and the girls in my life to feel like they're just as capable of telling a guy to shut up as a guy is of telling a guy to shut up and that they yeah. don't need to be cosseted and protected and patronized to and, and pandered to. That's what bothers me about it. Not the impact yeah. on men. Yeah. It's actually dehumanizing. So one of the things I think about a lot and I write about this in my book is, you know, there's this premise of punching up versus punching down. So this comes from comedy, right? I'm sure you know this. So like you're allowed mm. to make fun of somebody or tell jokes about somebody if they have more power than you do, if they're a celebrity, if they're a political figure, if they're a rich person, whatever it is, then you can, you can, you know, you can, Raz them and beat up on them and make fun of them. Okay, so we have now this sort of um, this kind of pretense in in popular in cultural discourse that it's okay for women to complain about men or make fun of them or say that they're fragile or talk about male tears and uh, just have this kind of you know these memes that are just like constantly sustaining this joke of what losers men are and to me that would then uh, imply that you are punching up. Like it's okay to do this because you're punching up and that therefore you're assuming that men have more power. Like you're putting them on right. a pedestal. You're handing them power that they didn't necessarily have. And frankly, they probably don't have because other than the, you know, certain captains of industry and a very small, you know, sliver of people running Silicon Val Valley and, and um, running fortune 500 companies, you know, put those guys aside, the vast majority of men uh, in the world, in the U.S., certainly in the, in the U.S., in the in the in the West, let's say. <clears throat> right. The vast majority of men are not doing nearly as well as most women. They're they're not attaining the same education level. They're not, for instance, like buying their own real estate. I always think that home ownership is an interesting metric. Mm. I know you. I know you like that word. Um, <laughs> if you don't so, find a way to insert metric into the conversation at least every ninety seconds, the interview no, is over. No, it's good. It, 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 like, it immediately elevates the discussion. Thank you. It's like the bus in uh, speed. You have to keep up a certain pace of yeah. of, of dropping uh, intellectual pseudo jargon into the conversation. Otherwise, we terminate. yeah. No, it's good. I also like to say flashpoint. Oh, that's that good. That might be a good one too. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I just, it, it seems to me so counterintuitive. Like why would you, the more women make fun of men, the more they are just, you know, sending the message that we assume that men are more powerful than we are. What would happen if we laughed at them? What would happen if we ignored them? What if we rolled our eyes? Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of what we did in the 80s and the 90s. 
And uh, I don't know what happened to that. I think social well, media came in and changed things. Well, I mean, what, what about the argument that I can imagine some, uh, some women's activists making in my head uh, along that metric that they would say, well, yeah, in the 70s and 80s, maybe rhetorically uh, we weren't quite so upset, and I'm sorry that our upsetness is upsetting you, Megan, but we also still don't have the political representation that men have. We still don't have the representation on Fortune 500 boards and so on that men have. So there's a lot to be angry about. It didn't work to just roll our eyes. Yeah, there's a lot to be angry about, but my question is, okay, what do you do with the anger? What do you do after that? Uh, It just, it's, I, I feel like there needs to be, you know, if, if you want to be, uh, if you want to run a Fortune 500 company, then we need to have some serious conversations about why there aren't more women in those roles and what could be done to um, have more women coming up through the pipeline. I mean, at the end of the day, now this is where people start to get mad at me. Um, female biology is really um hindering. It, it hampers us. The fact that women have, are the ones that have to gestate and lactate and raise small children, that by definition is going to make it difficult for them to rise in a capitalist system. But it needn't um, be and- nearly as difficult as it is, for example, if the, if the care for young children was shared between the sexes, or is that not desirable? Well, it's desirable, but is it really, is it really possible? I mean, the woman can can a father? I mean, this is I'm just posing this as a thought experiment. Obviously, there are there are parent partnerships that are about as equal as you can get. But at the end of the day, the father uh, can't stay home and breastfeed, uh, and so the woman is going to lose time in the workforce. As long as mm. we have a workforce structured the way it is, women and they're going to have to do it. But if you have two kids, you're going to have to take time out twice, three kids, it goes on and on. So I just, and I'm not saying this is okay, but I'm saying in order to try to fix it, and I don't think it will ever be totally made equal, but in order to try to get there, we need to actually admit, okay, women are held back in this way. There are difference between the sexes and there are, and women tend to make choices about their careers um, that, that reflect their desire or their need to have a more flexible work schedule. That's right. But like the the five years or eight years that women on average lose out of the workforce doesn't need to be, I mean, it needs to be, it needs to be the final three months of the pregnancy or two months or whatever it is, or maybe one month. I don't don't even know. I guess you can work right up until the week of if you want to. Yeah, the the pregnancy is not the issue. But then afterwards, I mean, you can pump milk and refrigerate it and the husband can heat it up. I mean, I'm raising twin toddlers with another guy and we managed, I mean, we get, you know, they probably got onto formula before they should have, uh, but we were able to, we we did it. Uh, It's conceivable. Like you could have women going back to work after one month or something and only take a couple of months off instead of five years. Isn't there something structural about the, the assumptions of, uh, of who does housework and who does looking after the baby yes. that yes. encourages it, it women is to structural, do it? But why is it that, uh, women, you know, who go to, go to law school, they're a law partner for a certain amount of time and then they have kids and they leave that level. They, they go and do other kinds of litigation. They're not going to be working 80 hour weeks. Mm. And is that because somebody is saying, absolutely, no, you can't do this. No, it's they're, they're choosing. Now the question is, are they choosing because they, they really have no choice. A lot of them actually don't want to work 80 hours a week. Yeah. And and it's a tough thing to admit. I mean, this is like, you know, the fact is most people don't want to work 80 hours a week. (laughs) That's right. Um, I mean, all of my friends who, you know, who went into high flying, high powered jobs because they wanted to be rich are now incredibly miserable, uh, much more miserable than the ones of us who chose riskier sort of creative pursuits and uh, and thought that we were going to be poor. Uh, and now the the rich ones, they still have a lot of money to blow on cocaine and fast cars, but they don't have anything they enjoy in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they work too so, hard. the The gender wage gap vanishes uh, when you take children out of the equation. Childless women, I, I don't think there's any wage gap at all. I think, in fact, they might make a little bit more on the dollar than mm. men in the U.S. Anyway, let's talk about that wage gap. I mean, I, it strikes me that before we get there, it strikes me that you're actually saying two things, and you claim to be saying the 
that you claim to be saying that it's controversial to say the uncontroversial one, actually, but what you're nodding mm. at is the more controversial one. The uncontroversial one that you're saying is controversial is that having children impacts on women's ability to attain equality, professional equality. But the thing that you're pointing to, which is more controversial, is that it's not just a, that's not just a physiological, biological problem, that that's actually a difference in preferences. And this is a, this is a, a touchier subject, right. but it is true that if you get a thousand females in a room and you tell them that they can choose bet- to spend their morning one of two ways, they can either take apart a complicated machine full of widgets and then they can put it all back together again, or they can help mediate a conversation right. between uh, a, a several people from a fam- from a, an estranged family who need to reconcile e- themselves, you know, each other. Uh, then a majority of women choose the latter, and if you choo- get a thousand men in a room, then a majority of them choose the former. So, like whether that's cultural or not, there are differences in the kinds of things we want to do, and this is where I start thinking about, well, what does that mean for female participants? Like, do as many women want to be Fortune 500 CEOs? Do as many women want to be engineers? Maybe they're uh, maybe they're happy being overrepresented as nurses and teachers. Yeah. I don't know. Well. Okay, so there's a couple, there's several different things going on here. First, the the phenomenon you just described is is a separate category from the the reproduction child yes. bearing child bearing category. Yeah, I I know you know that. So so just to address what you just said, the fact is that if you look at who comes out of um, engineering programs at MIT, for instance, I think it's like 20% women, 80% men. And so this is why Google can't achieve gender equality in terms of their engineer employees, software engineers. So why is that? Is it because women feel discriminated against? Is it because they're, you know, they're, they're left out of STEM fields? There have been for decades now, initiatives all over public education to get girls interested in STEM. And again and again, we're seeing that when given the choice, um, some girls go into STEM and some do engineering, and there are absolutely female engineers out there, but they tend to be outliers. In the aggregate, most women uh, want to have, want to spend their days communicating. They're drawn to people rather than things. And the other thing is you know, Heather Hying talks about this a lot, the evolutionary biologist. Women uh, tend to be, if, if, if they're good at math and science, they also tend to be good at languages. And men who are good at math and science, on average, in the aggregate, tend to only be good at math and science. Mm. So what happens is women actually have a choice. And they're going to choose one or the other. And so there is a likelihood that they're going to choose the, the humanities or the, the communication piece and Mm. not the engineering piece. So that's why we have this. It's actually because women are uh, more competent overall. That's why we have this. Right. And isn't there also some data about the extremes being occupied more by men? So men are overrepresented in, you know, uh, the very, very highest and very, very lowest percentiles of IQ and uh, and competence and things like that. Like there are a lot more men in jail, but there are a lot more men winning Nobel Prizes. That's right. There are more very, very smart men and very, very stupid men. Mm. But women are actually, I think, on average, are slightly have slightly higher IQs than men, sort of in the middle of the tail there. But yeah, men are at the extremes. What do we do with all this if conversations, if when we start to broach it, we sound like we're apologists for the patriarchy? I think we just have to keep saying it. Part of the problem is that sometimes... Uh, the people speaking loudest about this are not speaking about it in a very responsible way. Right. I think that smart, thoughtful people have to not be afraid to talk about it uh, because these kind of uh, reductionist uh, loudmouths are are hijacking the, the discussion and it's not getting us You anywhere. mean people who actually do want us to return to a 1950s gender role? Some of, I don't. Some of them do. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not all. I just think you know. Again, this and I often, uh, I often ask myself and others like, why you know when we talk about these heterodox 
uh, kind of, you know, thinkers and people willing to have these conversations, these dangerous, uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> Don't why, you tease the title of why my podcast. I'm not, not, I'm, I'm embracing it. I'm not, it's, it was a, that's it was a, a very, that, effect, it was a very a affectionate me- tease. It's a metric along which I will always defend this show. Um, uh, why are there so many more men in this space? That's another horrible word, yeah. right? This, <laughs> this, this intellectual space. There's, there are a lot more men than women. And I think that's because, the social penalties for stepping out of your peer group or your tribe and talking about things that might upset people, the social penalties are high. And again, on average, women are going to be more sensitive and aware of that kind of uh, casting out um, the in-group, out-group dynamic that comes into play when people start you know, disagreeing uh, vehemently about these things, men are more likely to like brush it off or not notice it. And women are more likely to kind of take it to heart. You know, it kind of comes down to like men are all men are just like a little bit autistic. <laughs> it's true. I know, I'm laughing because I am, but I am in comparison to other men as well, just a little, a little on the spectrum. I mean, I don't mean that to in a literal way. I've never been diagnosed, but my partner is absolutely certain. Like I'm very, I just don't understand why we have to have so many feelings about things. Can't we just be a bit more rational? And that's well, not, you could just be a libertarian. Don't. I think I think all libertarians are autistic. I mean, is that not clear? Right? Don't you think? Yeah, maybe, maybe. There's but see, sometimes, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, sometimes I think I'm a, a little bit autistic. So I, so I'm a sort of. I, I mean, I don't. I. I I don't see myself as like a masculine woman in any way. I don't think anybody who knows me would think that. Um, even though I do drive a Subaru, but, but as we oh, we've been through this the, on your uh, podcast, as, as we've talked about, you were but, talking um, about she's. If you want to listen to a long conversation about the kinds of vehicles that Megan has chosen to drive in her life, no. from Volvos to Subarus, go and uh, listen to my appearance that's, on Megan's show, uh, which is a wonderful long, podcast called The not Unspeakable a long Conversation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I was going to say. What was I saying? I don't. Saying, uh, oh, I, don't I, think that, I think I'm a little bit. I think my temperament, for whatever reason, is such that um, I, I'm kind of like I, I, I'm not as into feelings, maybe, as some women. Right. Uh, but I, there's something see, about me that's a little bit more. I, I just can. I'm a little bit um, a little bit sort of tougher and not. This is not necessarily a good thing. But I'm this is also so pejorative, great. Megan, in a way that I, I, I always I make the same sort of what I think is an error, which is conflating irrational feelings with feelings. Like, you do have feelings. You have exactly the same quantity of feelings as any other human being, presumably. Like, and I am sure that I do as well. But what we mean when we say that we don't have feelings is that our feelings map for, this is a very, a very autistic, Math? a Math? very autistic thing like to metric. say. This is this is this is a very mathematical and autistic thing to say. But that they map more accurately onto reality. They map more accurately onto my rational understanding of the world. They're not unhinged and untethered to the things that matter to me intellectually. So it's not that I have less feelings. It's that I don't fly off the handle in directions where the feelings take me far away from what my rational brain thinks should be important. Does that make any sense or is that but nonsense? You, and you trust that. You trust that as as reality. You 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 trust that about yourself. Because it's I often like it's like the people who who don't think they're crazy are the ones that are crazy. Or if if you think you're crazy, then you're not crazy, right? That's the what the that's the formula. So yeah. sometimes I think like maybe, okay, am I Am I missing something? Am I not feeling something I should feel? Or no, I do. Da- I, I do doubt being, it. But I think that empathy. I. I think I only doubt it because we're being gaslit. <laughs> you're really <laughs> knocking them out of the park with the words. We're no, talking you know about I mean? our. Like, we're talking about our lived experience right now. Well, <laughs> that's another horrible cliche. If people don't get that reference, if they, if you're not online enough to get that reference, it's what uh, it's what you have well, to say. Well, that's what we used to about... call anecdotal evidence, by the way. Yeah, we used ooh, that's to say good. that was anecdotal yes. evidence, and people say, "Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Let's look at the data." Yeah. And now, if you say. Well, that's my lived experience. They go, oh, okay. It's a Trump well, card. Yes, that's right. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you said something interesting early, earlier, which was that um, uh, I can't remember. You, it was something to do with like my not being a woman or like you right. having. Right. So the I was saying I'm like a little bit like a guy, and be, and because I don't, um, I can handle people people being mad at me. Like my entire career, 
I have had like angry letters to the editor and people sort of being angry with me and pleased with me in equal measure. Uh, and so I just, for some reason, uh, I can stomach it. But it's interesting because I hate when people are mad at me in real life. Like I live for some stuff like not being my fault. Mm. Uh, and so it's, yeah, that's strange. I almost court controversy in my professional life and I will do anything to avoid confrontation in my personal life. Interesting. But let's just, I want to get there as well because I want to talk about family and stuff like that. But let's just stay on lived experience because I was just trying to remember what, so what it was that pinged in my brain when you said that was that the only experience I have as to whether or not we are exaggerating the extent to which we feel oppressed as minorities is along the metric, huh? Uh, along the metric of being gay, which is the only minority status that I can, yeah, that's, uh, that's the only got. card I've that's got in got. my, yeah. right? And, yeah. and I can say that when the LGBTQI, STUV, WXYZ community speaks on my behalf, I often don't hear anything that I understand. Uh, again, all, add all the caveats about being a privileged uh, white male and so on and living in a, in a, a tolerant society. But uh, I don't feel that on a daily basis there's any impediment. If anything, I think there's probably a slight upside because it makes me a little bit more interesting. Uh, and so, you know, mm. it sort of ticks a diversity a diversity box in people's, in people's minds. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so when I hear accounts of what it's like to be a person of colour or to be a woman, I... I there is a certain amount of scepticism in my mind when claims are made that it is a daily burden. Right. Just by analogy, because I hear people say that it's a daily burden to be gay, and it's not. Now, there are ways in which it's uncomfortable, but it, it's, it, it does not keep popping up, and it, it certainly doesn't, just doesn't strike me that my female friends and colleagues are enduring a daily burden of being a woman. Now that there might be these big meta structural things going on that are impeding them in certain ways, but I, in the circles that I swim in, you are much likelier to get uh, promoted and to have yes. uh, have opportunities provided to you because everyone is being conscious of diversity at the moment. It's a conversation constantly in every production right. meeting. We're always thinking about diversity. We're always thinking about sex. I mean, at the organisation I work in, there are literally charts and spreadsheets that you have to fill out charting every single guest who's on every single show making sure that there is that you're meeting diversity quotas yeah. but so, that's only in the last few years so of course, of course in fairness people are talking about structural discrimination that's been going on for for decades so you know we're, yeah. we're or oh, millennia. There's, a, there's an overcorrection yeah there's an overcorrection right now but i don't i sometimes like okay i say being a woman, yes, to me, it's an it's an advantage. Like I was, I was an opinion columnist at the Los Angeles Times for over a decade, and I know that I was able. They gave me that column in part because they needed a chick columnist, you know. Mm. And uh, I I was happy to do that. Uh, so uh, so I guess it 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 works for me, but I also like. I've never had, I'm really lucky. I've never had anything terrible happen to me. I've never been assaulted. I've never been like physically harmed in any way because I was a woman. So, you know, I am coming from a place of, uh, I've had good luck and I've had, you know, I've had the, I was able to make good choices and, and all that stuff. So, mm. uh, I can see like if you are a girl and you grow up in a family where you have a tyrannical, chauvinistic sexist father who says you can't go to college and your brother's going to go to college. Yes, you, you would feel that way. Yes. Um, and the same would be true of a tyrannical father who said, you know, who was nasty along any wait for it metric, uh, regardless of whether or not you were a gay kid who was trying to come out uh, or whether or not you weren't as good at sports as he wanted you to be. Or maybe he was, you know, uh, he was a chauvinist towards his own culture because he's a first generation migrant and wants you to be yeah. really religious and you don't want to be religious. There are all kinds of ways in which people can be assholes. Right. But, you know, so but what we have now is the most privileged women in the history of civilization uh, deciding that it's never been a worse time to be 
a woman. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Like J.K. Rowling, you know, she made she wrote her statement uh, about, you know, she was defending herself after being canceled, like, you know, this last time. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, it's I, the, what I'm about to say has nothing to do with her. Can you just give people a background to that if yeah. they somehow missed yeah. it? So J- J.K. Rowling is, I think she's the author of the, the Harry Potter books. Is yes. that what she, yes, she's the author of Harry Potter. And <laughs> I love that there becomes, was even uncertainty about that. She's, she's the, the most no, famous no. and successful well, have, author in the kids. world, Megan. She's, yes. Okay. You mean it's not Dan Brown? <laughs> it's not Dan Brown anymore. Oh, not he's anymore. so 2011. Uh, look, I'm so 2011. Okay, you know what? I am point. so 1997. And so is Dan Brown, actually, probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So J.K. Rowling has become uh, controversial because she's like uh, her, a feminist and she criticizes the 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 trans uh, you know certain kind of of trans activism that sees uh biological sex as a construct and she wants to protect women's spaces anyway she's become a an enemy of the trans community and she wrote a statement really all i'm saying is she she wrote a statement addressing this sort of fairly recently and she talked about the the difficulty of being a woman and she said i have never in my life i have never seen uh, a worse time for women or a more terrible time for women. And I'm thinking, what? But I, I, what she meant was that in her lifetime, which is probably roughly the same as my lifetime in terms of years, maybe a little more, she, it's, we've never seen such ubiquitous pornography. We've never seen women's bodies uh, being uh, sort of exploited and constantly Uh, on view in this particular way because of social media. That is true. That is definitely true. Um, But that is not the same as it's never been a worse time for women. That's a separate issue. Right. It's it's never been a better time to be a woman, honestly. Like, would you like to go back to... (laughs) <laughs> any any point 14, you know, would you like 78. to go, or like you know 1971 like you I, it's really um let's let's put this in perspective mm. so you know obviously yes there's there's work to be done but you can't um even get to it if you don't uh accept reality and there just seems it's, it's really turned into this like fashion to to complain about about men and it's a joke but it's like not a joke i think it's really i think it chips away at 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 our credibility and our dignity as women frankly louis ck used to have a bit where he would turn this on its head by saying uh, you know it he he feels really bad about it but it is awesome being a white guy because if he got in a time machine he could go literally anywhere at any time <laughs> and he would right. be they would love him he'd be it would be great but like you if you're a black guy or a woman you can't like you can't even go back you know more than 30 years yeah, and there's expect a it to be point okay for yeah. all of us that's, yeah that's, that's right. true yeah uh the, on before we leave that question about pornography and sexual violence um it would be easy not to wade into these waters but it is called uncomfortable conversations so allow me to get a little bit uncomfortable um this is a this is one of those things that i find really difficult because it's something that potentially affects all women and so it gets framed as a gender thing which on one level obviously it is but it's something that is entirely perpetrated by a very small minority of men predators Basically, like the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of sexual violence is undertaken by a small group of men who, as far as I can tell, are completely ostracized by, again, maybe I'm living in a very progressive, like sensitive new age guy kind of community, but every single guy I know roundly, I mean, would never even think of doing something like this, unless they're psychopaths and they're, and they're doing it secretly behind the scenes. But I mean, I talk to them in private. I talk to them in unguarded moments. We, we, you know, share ourselves and we're all committed to respecting all people, regardless of their sex. I mean, this is one of the weird things that when, like when Trump's pussy tape came out and there yeah. was all this conversation about, oh, it's just sort of locker room talk. This is the way guys talk. It, I've never heard it. Like I've no, never heard, room that's not how men, honestly, that's not how we talk. Like I've never, okay. I've never spoken that way. I know there are some no. people who talk that way. I've never heard a friend talk that way. That's a very, very particular well, thing. And here, here's the thing with that. It's not locker room talk. It's shock jock talk. 
If right. you listen to Howard Stern, if you listen to certain kind of morning radio, that's that's the uh, vernacular. Like that's where that is coming from. I thought that pussy thing was. A, such a red herring. I didn't care about that. Like I, I was happy about it because I thought it would be like the thing that got Trump to go away. Of course, like every <laughs> new thing that comes out, like this is going to be it. You know, um, but he's no, like a zombie just, who just keeps coming towards you as you fire the gun. Yeah, the 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 reaction to that, and you see this again and again. It just it feels off to me. Like it feels. I'm not even going to say intellectually dishonest because I think that the people who were reacting to it were doing so sincerely. And see this again, then this takes me back to like, well, I I might just like not thinking like a regular woman. Like, why am I, why am I hearing this differently? Is it because like I was a big Howard Stern listener for a long time and I just sort of know where that uh, this, this was not said on the Howard Stern show, just to be clear, but just that sort of that, that mode it is its own thing and I don't particularly like it. It's not very interesting at all, but it's not, um, I just think it's not, it's, it, it doesn't affect us. It's not reality. Like mm. let's get upset about real things and not pretend that the outrage felt a little manufactured. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always couched in. I mean, I, we even hear it now before the uh, the election. Like, what will we tell our daughters? What will we tell our daughters if we elect this man to be? And like, right. I mean, That's, it reminds me a little bit. That. It reminds me a little bit of like when I've been traveling in conservative countries. Like, I had a, a friend in Cuba when we were traveling around there who didn't realize that I was married to a guy, and we were talking about gays and he was like talking about he was being really homophobic and talking about how disgusting it was he was like you know men shouldn't be able to kiss in the street because he's like what will i tell my son and i was like oh i've heard this before i've heard this before actually the homophobes refrain is the same as the feminists refrain in a different form here it's this kind of overly precious uh puritanical attitude towards it's paternalistic it's paternalistic yeah Yeah. what what do you mean what you tell your your son or your daughter like you'll just say the world is complicated and and some people are assholes and some people love different people i don't know right no they hate it when the conservatives say things like we should cherish our daughters i'm the father of daughters as the as the father of daughters they hate that but then it's always like what will i tell my daughter about hillary's defeat it's like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's the horseshoe theory. It's a perfect example of that. Like, you know, these extremes, they just, they come around and they, they meet at, at the ends. So, uh, yeah, I don't know this, you know, I also like, I, I think a lot about this idea of t- if there's going to be toxic masculinity, then we have to acknowledge that there's toxic femininity. Like everyone can be an asshole. We're all, mm. it's equal opportunity to be a complete jerk, to conduct yourself in, in a manipulative uh, emotionally abusive way, uh, if that's your thing. And, and frankly, women are, are much better at emotional abuse than men are. I mean, we're much better gaslighters if you want to well, go back to that. Yes, I do think women tend to be much smarter about how to manipulate people emotionally than men do. Men just come barging straight in the front door. Right. And they're very easy to handle because of that. Yeah. Not physically, obviously, to be sure that's a different thing. But yeah, men are just very simple. See, this is the thing. I think that, you know, we talk about power and men have all this power and yes, physically and structurally, historically and, you know, within the economic system. Yes. But within any given relationship, the power is constantly going back and forth. So to just assume that um, in any kind of exchange, if it's a sexual encounter, whatever it is, that the man has all the power by default, that is just really simplistic and sexist, right? Mm, mm. What do you make of like power differentials between, you know, at the old rich guy and the young woman dangling off his arm? I, <laughs> I sometimes sort of I, like, I don't know, I don't quite know what to make about whether I should think that that is sexist. Uh, I know. I think about this more and more the older I get because I notice that. Because <laughs> like, you're becoming a cougar. Like I become no, no. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I notice that like men my own age, they they get older and their girlfriends get younger sometimes. Yeah. Um. But that's a little bit different than what you're referring to—the sort of gold digger dynamic. No, not necessarily. I mean, it was, I, mean right. I yeah. just think I'm so I like I have on one morning I could get up and I could think, you know what? There's nothing wrong with fat old rich 
men dating like 25 year old beautiful girls if they if they're both getting something out of it because you bring to the relationship whatever cards you have in your yeah. you have to play and if what you have to yeah. play is i'm rich i'm rich and powerful then you play that card and if on the other hand as a 25 year old woman you get to play the i'm sexy and i want to have lots of fancy nights out at fancy clubs and bottle service and yachts and this guy can do it for me then i play that card and yeah. it's it's sort of yeah. condescending to regard anyone as better or worse but then i could wake up on another day and think that's foolishly sort of libertarian and in reality we live in a world where power and wealth are accumulated among fat men uh so of course younger women have to degrade themselves in order to acquire some of it and i don't know which to believe uh well i think both can be true uh with really anything like this there you know there's not two sides to the story there's like three or four or five there's there's lots of different ways into this so a 25 year old woman uh in a certain way has more power than say a 55 year old man because she has her, she's has youth. I mean, for, for women, youth is the ultimate currency, right? And I guess for men, money and status would be, I'm talking in the most basic, just primal terms here. So people don't, don't write in and yell at me, but you know, one of the things I think about, like, you know, so when I was, I was actually just talking about this with a guest on my podcast, the sort of mentor-mentee relationship, right? So when I was in my 20s, I sometimes had older, more established men kind of take me under their wing, advise, give me career advice, whatever. And it wasn't, nothing ever crossed the line. It was not, There was nothing inappropriate. I mean, probably if I had let there be, that might have come into the picture. But just to be clear, it was, it was you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. But I often wondered, like, so are the 25 year old men that I know who are aspiring in this field, getting the same sort of mentorship? Like, are they having an older guy, mm. be, you know, sort of like, oh, come along, I'll, you know, I'm gonna, you know, you're the, you're the son I never had. Like, is that the dynamic? Because I don't think they're necessarily being mentored by like, you know, Mrs. Robinson or something like yeah, that, yeah. that you don't see. Um, so is it like women have this advantage when they're young of being able to kind of reap the benefits of of an older man, whether it be wisdom or opportunities or money or whatever it is. And then sort of when they get older, they've <laughs> they've spent their currency and then men, you know, they mm. when they get older, they have it. I don't know, because young, men, you know, a 25 year old man really doesn't have a lot going for him. And a 25 year old woman uh, has certain advantages that she won't have in 20 years. So interesting that you say that about, yeah, about the mentorship role that can, because there are two people who I know, who I know to have mentored a lot of young men, uh, one of whom was a mentor to me who was my first boss uh, in radio. Uh, and that was because, that was half because he had the hots for me. I mean, mostly intellectually, I think, but, uh, you know, also also elsewhere. And <laughs> and another one is, is Kevin Spacey, who was renowned mm. as being a half predator and half really useful uh, mentor who took a lot of care and attention on young aspiring actors' careers and lives when he was running, was it the old Vic or whatever theatre he run in, ran in London? Uh, oh, and, okay. you know, he would surround himself with beautiful young actors and coach them and, you know, stay up late at night drinking wine with them and so on. And so it's interesting that you say that because there you've got two examples of of gay mentors who probably overstepped uh, boundaries, well, certainly in the case of Kevin Spacey, um, but who, who may also have done some sort of good in the conventional mould of the of the mentor. But we're also saying that it's men who do this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's in right. In both cases, it's men, you know, yeah, so like men. women are not going to uh, kind of use sexual, I don't want to say coercion, but kind of uh, they don't, they, they're not going to use that as a, as leverage. I mean, there obviously are exceptions, but like, I think, you know, generally this is a, a, a move that you see men do. Just, well, I wonder if know. it's, is, is there a sort of status thing going on as well where, um, I mean, this might not apply in the gay scenarios that I just articulated, but maybe in the straight ones that there's a, that 
that the young woman is a kind of currency. So, you know, for that that doesn't exist for for a young man with an older woman. That be, just being seen at the fancy right. restaurants in Manhattan oh, absolutely. with a bunch of absolutely. beautiful women is it's part tro- of the, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You you can yeah, it's a way of it's a I mean, they don't call it trophy wives for yeah. nothing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um yeah, that's so, that's true. Megan, you said a few moments ago, youth is the ultimate currency. If youth is the ultimate currency, how it do you? It can be. I mean, let's in the in the most basic sense. Yes. Yeah. How do you feel about aging? <laughs> um, I I I think about it a lot. I don't like it. I was all I was like one of these precocious people. Like I when I was starting out, I I mean I had sort of success in my writing career pretty early and I was always like the youngest person in the room and you know people be like oh I can't believe how young you are and Mm. so I always and I would have like older boyfriends like not like super older but you know like I was in my 20s I would you know I didn't go out with all that many guys who were also in their 20s um I mean you know we're talking I dated people in their thirties. Let's not <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, but you know, I, uh, so I always like my, my image of myself is still of a young person. Like I, I'm, I'm, I kind of like sort of, oh, oh I'm just like, you know, I'm just a scrappy. I'm mm. just going to make it like, I'm still trying to make it. And you know, it's funny. Like I used, it dawned on me the other day, I had to beg for help from uh like a 35 year old for like some tech like some technical help some like social media web (laughs) stuff i was trying to do and i thought god you know when was the when was the turning point it used to be that when i was seeking advice like 10 times out of 10 it was from somebody older right somebody older and wiser and now it's almost always from somebody younger like how would you, even even a kind of career thing like 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 setting up the podcast like I <laughs> you know I got this podcast going seriously I mean I sought so much advice because I'm doing it totally on my own and I was really at sea and I asked people just you know everyone I could think of and I'd say most of them were younger than me yeah and then the, even the even the ones who are younger than you who are 35 they're like oh I know this great 19 year old well that's what you need I yeah. mean yes yeah. I would uh, a 19 year old uh, like in-house technical support person would be great. We were talking earlier about lived experience and how, like you were saying, like that used to just be called like anecdotes that you could ignore. Anecdotal uh, evidence. Anecdotal, yes. anecdotal <laughs> evidence. Whimsy at best. Yeah, and 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 being a bit sort of autistic. And it reminded me of arguments that I get into with my partner who is very woke and, uh, you oh. know, I'll I'll just sort of, you know, we'll have, we'll just have, be having what I think is an intellectual conversation about, uh, you know, the, st- the, the terrible statistics on policing in the United States and how many people get injured and accidentally killed by police officers in the U S and I'll in passing make the, the point when he says that, you know, oh, you know, it's disproportionately people of color. Well, actually it's not, um, right. actually pr- uh, proportionally it's about, that's always great at a dinner party expect. too. If you can just, if you can just drop that in, like they'll be talking about like, uh, no, actually guys, no, no. And and even I have, a, I have like, the statistics right here. A lot of people yep. who are listening to this right now will be like, "No, no, why is Josh even saying that?" And they'll be rushing to Google to tap, tap, tap. Um, but yeah. it is true that uh, it's you know within the past ten years or so that the, they've been able to stabilize the, any racial disparities. So it's basically what you would expect now on the basis of what of the way that crime is distributed. Um, and he will find that to be not merely a factual claim but an emotional attack on his, on people he knows and, and values that he cherishes. Yeah. Like there's no way for him to not see it as being a racist uh, blindside. And that's sort of what I meant by like being a bit autistic where I'm able to compartmentalise and go what we're talking about here are data and whether or not it is – whether or not – this fact is factually true about the number of fatal encounters that people have with police officers in the United States. It has nothing to do with my commitment to social justice and racial equality. Right. Uh, but it does have something to do with that when it's all tangled up. And I, I worry that 
this rhetoric about the lived experience, my lived experience as a gay man, your lived experience as a woman, the lived, you know, have you actually been a victim of sexual violence? That's wonderful that you haven't, but in that case, you wouldn't possibly understand the lived experience of someone who has, and I can't understand the lived experience of an Indigenous yeah. Australian, and I can't, that we're just burrowing ourselves down into containers of our own sort of creation where we're incapable of finding a common ground that we can all stand on to assess reality and what we need to do about it. Um, so I don't know where that was going, but I wonder if you want to opine on it. Well, it's the where it's the what we want to do about it question. I mean, I because yeah, I hear people say, well, okay, maybe you can show me the statistics that say that uh, black men are not shot and killed by police uh, at a significantly higher rate than white men. Okay, well, maybe you can show that to me. But even if it's that, even if that's true, why bother? Why bring that up? Why, why is it important to talk about that? It's obvious that we have such profound structural racism. It's obvious that the experiences of black people are, you know, like just difficult on a, on a daily moment by moment basis. Why, why do you have to like, you know, change the conversation? And I was like, well, let me think about that. And I guess it's because if you want to try to figure out how to make, changes you need to uh establish what is true mm. so uh, also you need to understand I, what the problem is i mean the problem well that's what yeah yeah if the if it's a it's a big difference if the problem is uh racial bias amongst american police officers or if the problem is uh under training and a propensity yeah. to violence more broadly among police officers and it's, right and, and the war it strikes on drugs. me that you're at I mean, risk of ignoring the yes, latter if you right. diagnose it as the former the idea that you could be asleep in your bed and a cop would come in and shoot you because of the color of your skin. Horrific, horrifying. If you believe that that's something that happens on anything resembling a regular basis, of course you're going to think there's never been a worse time in history. Hmm. Of course you're going to think that, that we've, it's never been a more racist time. It's never been a more violent time. The reality is that it's, there's never been less crime. I mean, maybe the last, the last six months, the crime is going up, but you know, we've never been, a healthier society. We've never been safer. There's never been less violence, but uh, this is just completely counter to what a lot of people have uh, established in their minds. You mentioned that you were successful quite early and you had a wild youth in New York City as a, as a successful writer. Have you ever been tempted? And so you had good reason to be proud of that. Uh, what do you make of being... Oh, I wasn't proud. I'm not I'm never proud of anything. No, I'm constantly... I'm Self-judgmental. Just, I'm, yeah, I'm very self-loathing. So, yeah. but anyway, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering what 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 makes you. I was going to ask what makes you proud, but um, perhaps nothing. But I'm interested in the idea of being proud of things that you didn't accomplish. This this came to me obviously in relation to gay pride, which I've never had. I don't really understand what that's supposed to mean. Uh, like I didn't really choose it. I mean, and to the extent that I did, kind of choose it. Because uh, I I could have married a woman and sort of le- led a reasonably happy life that way, but I happened to find a guy who I really liked. The, to the extent that I did choose it, why would that be something to be proud of? Like I don't think that it's a better or yeah. worse thing than it's sort of like being proud of the, like the sh- the color shoes. Like it doesn't even matter whether I chose the shoes or not; it's just sort of irrelevant. Um, and increasingly, I think we're proud of like th- there's this defiance of like sort of solidarity along racial lines, along gender lines. And I don't want my daughter to not be proud of being a girl, but I also don't want to be proud of being a girl. Are you proud of being a woman? Uh, I'm no, I, I like being a woman. Am I proud of it? Can you really, this, but it, again, this gets to your point. Is it possible or even reasonable to be proud of an immutable characteristic, an immutable trait, right? So uh, no, I see. The thing is, I see myself as a person first. I really, I kind of move through the world. Like I am a, I'm a person and, uh, you know, to the extent I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and, you know, it, you're, I think you're, I think your femaleness or your maleness is sort of like, you know, it, it, it surges in certain moments and then it, and then it dissipates and then you're going back to being a person. You know, when I never, I rarely feel like, Oh, I feel like sort of neuter, almost gender neutral when I'm like speaking in public, like when I'm in front of a microphone or I get in front of an audience and I can kind of like 
tell jokes. I mean, I'm not a stand-up comedian by any means, but like that that moment where you have the audience and they're laughing and you're kind of like there, that feels um, very not female. I mean, I've actually written mm. about this. Like there was the whole thing when Christopher Hitchens said women aren't funny mm. and, uh, and you know, here's why. I, I always thought that that was, uh, I mean, he's totally castigated for that, but I always thought that was sort of interesting because I do think that women are sometimes reluctant to be funny because there's something unfeminine about it. Like this idea like, oh, if you're funny, it must be because you're ugly or you're making up for not being hot or something like that. Hmm. Uh, and because uh, men will use humor if, you know, to sort of make up for being nerdy or whatever. Like, have you noticed that, I mean, like the, 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 the prom king and queen were not exactly like the funniest people in the school, <laughs> right? Like the, like the popular jock was probably not a comedian. Mm. Um, mm. And so what was I getting at? Yeah, I think there's something about just sort of speaking your mind and, Again, getting back to this, like, well, I'm not going to get that upset if people hate me on Twitter. Um, there is something sort of unfeminine about that, I guess. So yeah, I don't it'd be know. nice if it wasn't, though, isn't it? I mean, now we're sort of I know. going back into sort of stereotypes of female fragility, which I thought the whole point of feminism was was to reject. I'm a bit I'm a bit confused right. about what like modern feminism once like i'm a huge admirer yeah. of sort of second wave badass feminism <laughs> I don't like say of, badass don't say you're bad. not allowed I, to I, say I, that I, well okay. no i hate i hate uh -huh. that i was gonna call my book well my book had many working titles uh one of them was woke me when it's over <laughs> but um you are not a badass actually was, you've got a whole thing in, in the problem of with everything about badassery don't you yeah that, that's right you've yeah, got a gripe. yeah it's a great hashtag, book people should everyone badass. should read the problem with everything uh, a Journey Through the New Culture Wars and your other books, but that's your most Thank recent you. one. Thank you, Josh. Thank uh, you for plugging Yeah, that. okay, so not badass. You're right. There's a But there, but that's weird because the new badass, like, girl power, you go girl kind of thing Ugh. is tied. It's, the, it's corollary is, is a sort of female fragility. Yeah, because it's about surviving, right? So it's about surviving your own femaleness that makes you a badass. I know. Right. It's It's weird. I guess um, I I think that the the sort of notion would be well these second wave feminists they were so tough and everything but they they didn't have any choice or they just sort of you know they they didn't realize how bad it was or they just had to you know they rolled their eyes at these guys because that's what they had to do and yeah there is some of that there's there's definitely you know I I'm definitely aware of. This is something very female about me, having to smooth over a situation if some guy's just being awkward or, you know, embarrassing himself or like, you know, just creepy or mm. boorish in some way. Like you're going to go, ha ha ha, like I'm going to I'm going to get out of this in a graceful way. Like but that's, the, but that's, that's very that's female. what we should all do, isn't it? I, yeah. like, I don't I don't understand well, this new a lot thing of, guys of like do that. Don't they? Don't you just I mean, if someone well, is... you're gay, maybe gay guys. do it. <laughs> maybe. Seriously, I don't know. If someone makes um, an inappropriate joke, uh, don't you just roll your eyes and move on? Whereas now I feel like we're encouraged to, like, we have to take a stand about everything and we have to go to human resources right. if somebody says something inappropriate and, you know, we, they have to be given a warning. And uh, there's just, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of umbrage taking. Which... I know. But, uh, yeah. I think that that's so much about social media, though. Like, there was one, you know, I, I write about in my book, there was this moment um, when I was in my 20s, I lived in an apartment in New York, and there were, we always had three roommates uh, in the apartment, and somebody would move out, and then we would have to, like, advertise for a third roommate. Like, mm. we put the, we put a, you know, sign on a telephone pole <laughs> or something. like, And we would have a day where we would, people would come in, like, they would come in, and we would sort of audition them to be the roommate. Sure. And this guy came in, um, you know, we would had some men or some women, it didn't matter. Um, and he was, I don't know, he was probably in his 30s. So my, the other roommate and I were probably like 25 or something. And this guy was like this kind of, kind of loser guy, like older, like he was, you know, the fact that he needed to rent a room and, yeah. you know, this apartment, it was like, the rent was like $500. Uh, and he said something like, okay, well, how about... How, would you be open to this? Like, um, if, you know, if I lived here, I would, I would buy the food if you girls did the cooking, something like that. <laughs> and, and I remember that we couldn't, um, 
my roommate and I, we couldn't even make eye contact because we would have burst out laughing. Like we would mm. have just, we were so embarrassed for him and that we just sort of, you know, we're like, oh, you know, okay, whatever. And, um, and then he left and we just were like, oh my God. And that was hilarious. <laughs> now I, okay. That was probably 1995, 96, something like that. Now, if that had happened 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier to our mothers, second wave feminists, if that had happened in like 1965 or six, I think that that cohort of women would have uh, not found that so funny because they were closer to real chauvinism. They were living in the Mad Men world. Mm. They were working in those sorts of offices with guys pinching their asses. That was a real thing to them. So that they would not have found that so funny. Fast forward 20 years later, a, 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 you know, two roommates today having that sort of situation with a guy, what would they have done? He would have left, they would have run to their computers and posted something about the experience and they would have framed it in a certain way. And, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And like, you know, fuck men and all of this. And they mm. would have gotten a lot of feedback and it would have been this like, you know, dopamine hit and this kind of like echo chamber of of validation and sympathy and then and the whole experience would have just become something much more sort of seemingly terrible than it was and so i really think that i was sort of in a sweet spot in terms of my experience of being a woman like we were just able to kind of move through the world without you know with with unprecedented freedoms and without social media to distort our experiences but since, and it was a lucky yeah. thing since social media is becoming the dominant way that most of us interact with people is there a way of avoiding uh, an endless slide towards more of that i don't know it's really hard it's it's i we, because we're just not our our lived experiences are not really <laughs> uh being lived they're being uh, they're being sort of typed out or mm. they're being me memefied or, you know, I, it's like, I, I just think we're in a pretty, pretty tricky situation. I mean, I, this comes up with students all the time. Like I always, I'm like, you know, Mike, you've got to just take risks. You have to be honest. You know, you, you've got to like express original ideas and not be afraid of people hating you and not be afraid of people piling on you in Twitter, you know, and they say, well, that's easy for you to say, but, you know, our entire reputation is on the line. If I, somebody says, if I, if my first published piece ever gets me canceled on Twitter, that's it for me. Are and they right? A, I, maybe to some extent, I guess so. And I just, I just had this great privilege of being able to write controversial things um, and nothing bad happened to me. In fact, like that got me another assignment. That was the gig. And the gig now is just, uh, telling your audience what they already know and what they want to hear and doing it again and again. And to me, like, that's not why you become a writer. That's not why you become a, a thinker in the world. Like, I didn't get into the business for that. So, yeah, it, it makes me sad. It's interesting, isn't it, that ruffling feathers used to be an asset and now it's sort of a liability. Like, you're only allowed to ruffle feathers in the perfectly prescribed feather ruffling way at, yes, at the moment. Yes, which kind I, of defeats the purpose of ruffling. Yeah, I actually, just, <laughs> I actually just tweeted that I don't remember a time when we've been so conformist in our idea of what nonconformism is. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's well, like, it's like, is yeah, is yeah. there even a counterculture anymore, too? Like, is... I mean, there's, there's a performative just... social justice counterculture which has a, a, uh, energized a performative far right counterculture, which is a certain, you know the sort of Milo Yiannopoulos kind of uh, just shit stirring Dave Rubin type uh, space. Pardon the word space, but there's not a lot of actually nonconformist people or actually because I I mean you'd get you'd get cancelled. I mean how do you how do you not Right. Well, and the performative social justice culture has been embraced by the institutions. So it, therefore, it is right. it's not countercultural at all. It's completely mainstream. And then even people <laughs> right. like us. Once the biggest right. tech companies in the world are all firing people for, for speaking out against, uh, you know, against their right. woke platforms, right. you, you know that you probably yeah. won the culture war. All, all corporate HRs 
sound like the administration of Oberlin College. I think uh, I think we know where where we stand. But like, mm. yeah, even people like us who are you know wanting to have uncomfortable conversations, that is also like we have our silo. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's the thing. Like, yeah. we it's I I do worry about that, and I think about it, and I I really I, I there's no substitute just for kind of being in the world. And, and talking with people. I mean, it's funny, like I live in a very mixed neighbor. It's not even that mixed. Like there's, I live in a Dominican neighborhood. Um, there's all kinds of people, but I, the whites are in the minority. There's plenty of black people in my building and my neighbors. And I talk to people all day and we have normal interactions and we chat. And like, it's, you would, it's a totally different world from what's going on on Twitter. Like it's, yeah. a, it's a different universe. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, why, why have we decided that, that the Twitter universe is reality and reality is like just something that I'm seeing through my lens of privilege. And so therefore I must be missing 95% of it. Sounds like someone should get off Twitter, Megan. Yeah. But then how am I going to promote my podcast? Nah, just put it out. Just don't read it back. Just put things out. Just tweet out. Just do do the Sam Harris and don't look at the replies right. and the at mentions. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, we'll wrap up here, but I'm glad you mentioned that uh, mixed <laughs> that you didn't want to call the, the neighborhood mixed because the word diverse has also become become totally bastardized like the i i remember reading i remember the first time i saw it used to mean black in that it was it was talking well, about they say, like this person is very diverse, yeah, diverse. Like, they also say it that was... like how can you be individually diverse well it was a review of a tv show which was an all black cast and it was said it was it's wonderful to see a diverse tv show and i was like there has never been a tv right. show less diverse than this it's literally the definition of not being diverse and every other tv show has at least one token person of color this has no white people in it and you're calling it diverse what are we even talking about i know you know what you're also not allowed to say about neighborhoods anymore is that they're safe. So oh. I I uh, recently was in a situation I was describing my neighborhood and I, in some semi-official capacity and, and I referred to it as safe. And I was told, yeah, you know, um, we don't really use that word anymore in describing um, neighborhoods <laughs> because it's safe is really loaded, um, right. you know, for people in marginalized communities. And also like, you know, what may feel safe to you is not safe for somebody else. And um, so we'd really just like you to rephrase that. What if it's just based on crime statistics? Well, and actually, but I thought, you know what, actually, you're right, because crime has gone way up in New York City, uh, you know, in, in the last six months, thanks to our mayor and yeah. others. So, mm. so in fact, it's not that safe it's not anymore. not that safe. Except, thanks. Although the people, the people keeping it safe do seem to be people of color from the Dominican Republic. So maybe uh, maybe this other person is being racist by implying that Dominicans can't live in safe neighborhoods. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure uh, I'm sure that the Dominicans and others uh, would really appreciate their neighborhood not being called safe. Let's wrap um, by, uh, I, I want you to give advice to uh, to my daughter. If once she's old enough to be able to, oh. to think about uh, about being a, a woman, you've lived through, you've been a, a powerful but not badass young uh, oh. creative type in New York City in uh, the, I guess, the 80s and 90s. And so you've seen that evolution. Not of... the 80s. Not I was a teenager in the 80s. So okay. Let's, let's okay. be clear about that. You're yes. still probably conscious and cognizant of the, of the world teenager, around you. As a teenager, I don't know that I was, I, was, I was not very, very conscious. But yeah. Uh, um, okay. Yes. And, anyway, yes. And you've seen, you've wrestled with the issue of what it means to be a woman through the through the prism of, uh, of second wave feminism. And now you see modern feminism. What would you say to a 12-year-old? Uh, girl today about leading a good life? Oh my gosh. I guess just try to see yourself as a person. I, I mean, I, it's like you're, I mean, a lot of this gender stuff, I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but it seems to me like we're constantly, constantly sent the message that being female is a liability. Uh, it's a disadvantage. So like, it would make sense that then you would like say, well, why, why, why should I bother with this? Maybe I can, maybe I can be something else. I guess I would just say, um, you see yourself on a, have a, have a wide canvas for yourself. Like there's, there's a lot of ways of being female in the world. You can be a girly girl. You can be a tomboy. You can be like a butch lesbian. You can be a Disney princess. Like those are all ways of being female. You can drive a Subaru and still be like a straight chick. Like, you, you know, you can, <laughs> you can, there's, there's so many options. In fact, women have more options. Like we have, I think like a wider swath, at least, you know, when I was growing up, certainly like 
there were kind of like you know three versions of men it seemed and there were like endless versions of of being a woman and so i just felt really lucky that way so i guess i would hope that she would see um she would see femaleness as having a very uh wide bandwidth uh and not such a narrow one as seems to be um people's conception of it today Megan's award-winning book of original essays is called The Unspeakable and Other Subjects of Discussion. The Unspeakable is also the title of her wonderful podcast. Uh, and uh, your recent uh, guest was the one and only Josh Sepp's wonderful guy. Uh, love that man. Uh, the latest book is The Problem With Everything. It's, uh, it's excellent. It's an analysis of the new culture wars. Megan, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Josh. It's my great pleasure. Hello, this is Hannah from Red Handed. Would you like to watch something scary? Like, really scary. So scary you'll hide behind the sofa. Then you need Shudder. Shudder offers everything from the latest releases like The Boy Behind the Door and Psycho Gorman to untouchable favourites like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. Polygon describes Shudder as a horror movie paradise. And they aren't wrong. Shudder is the ultimate collection of classic and original horror which pushes boundaries and showcases original storytelling with something new to watch every week. It's available right now ad-free and on demand through all of the platforms you already use. Sign up now at shudder.com. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com. Shudder. So good, it's scary.